speaking of making yourself feel dumb and stretching your boundaries, we have lightning talks now. Yay. Where is our lightning talks? Oh, there he is. Yes. Thank you. Let's introduce and make Phil welcome, Christopher Neugebauer. Thank you. Thank you. Is this the, it is on. Uh, let's see. I have some cards here. Uh, Beck's done. If you can get on stage and plug your laptop in so that you can... Uh, uh, give your talk. Where is Bex? Hi. Uh, okay. Um, lightning talks. Uh, we know how this works, yeah? Uh, okay. Um, how do they work? Okay. Lightning talks. They are five-minute talks. Uh, pick, a, pick a side and uh, plug in and our AV person will mic you up. Um, so they're five minute talks on a topic of the uh, presenter's choice. They get uh, five minutes, they get no more than five minutes and it is your job as the audience to enforce the five minute time limit. Uh, we do this by starting a very quiet rolling applause sometime in the last five or so seconds of the talk. Uh, you can do this like this and if enough of you do this you can actually hear it. Okay? And, and then we applause um, once the time limit goes off, so that you can't actually hear the person on stage. So, yeah, applaud. Great, 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 stop. You've actually got good at it over the last few years, I'm, I'm glad. Last time, like the first few times I tried that, um, they'd be applauding for, the, for five minutes at the start of the lightning talks, and it was very, very embarrassing for all concerned. Um, we have 12 lightning talks. Um, Tim Ansel's going to be on this one, on this side, so if, I guess he can start setting up. Um, are, are we ready over on this side? Almost? We're, okay. Um, this, is, this is awkward. Normally there's some time to set up, and instead I get to stand on stage looking awkward for the first few minutes. Um, this is... Tell us a joke, Chris. <laughs> Hi, Benno. <laughs> Okay, I think, I think we're ready to go. So our first presenter is Bex Dunn, who is a landscape scientist at uh, Geoscience Australia. She's going to be talking about using satellite data to look through space and time and hopefully find useful stuff with Python. Stop. Okay, so. Thank you, that's really helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's the last one. Um, hello, uh, g'day. Um, as other people have said, there are a lot of you, um, which is a little bit surprising. Um, this is my first PyCon. Uh, <laughs> this is my first lightning talk. Um, <laughs> probably kind of goes with the territory. Um, I am a uh, landscape scientist at Geoscience Australia um, and thought I'd show you a very, very quick look at some of the things that I do in my day-to-day -day job with Python. Um, so, uh, with the wonderful help of the Windows snipping tool, <laughs> <laughs> the program I work for is Digital Earth Australia, which is part of Geoscience Australia. So. We have the archive of Australia's open satellite data, so space and time, 30 years deep, uh, and goes out to various bits in the ocean as well. Um, and we try and do awesome things with it for the public and for other people who might use it in the government as well. Um, so, this is an actual thing. Um, <laughs> It was not created using a machine learning algorithm. Um, I would like to use some machine learning algorithms on it, uh, but this is a mathematically transformed piece of part of the Cooper Basin in Western Australia and has some bright pink salty things and some blue wet things and some pale blue sometimes wet things and some yellow things that are sometimes green. So. <laughs> what it actually is, is it's a, a compilation through space and time of the behaviour of part of our landscape in Australia. 
Um, one thing that I'm constantly reminded of is the fact that Australia is incredibly, stunningly beautiful. And I'm really lucky to be able to look at it from space all the time. Sorry, that's probably way too close. Um, but looking at things all squished together can be really complicated. So one of the other things we do is try and break things down and display them. So I'm also really lucky in that I work with a whole bunch of really, really talented developers and scientists. So one of my colleagues showed me how to make animations recently. Um, so we use X-ray, we use pandas, we use matplotlib. Uh, this is using all of those things and it's looking at environmental water flowing into an area uh, of the Macquarie Marshes in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, and it's looking at how uh, the water that we use in the Murray-Darling Basin, how it contributes back to the landscape as well. So I'm not sure how we, well you can see it. I stole it from another slide, which was mine. Um, but the green stuff is growing plants and trees. The dark stuff is water. And the graph, which is taken from uh, some stream gauges, is the water going in as well. So uh, all our code is open, and we encourage you to go and play with it, use it, tell us what's wrong with it. Um, our API is Python. It's called Digital Earth Australia, and we have a read the docs as well. Uh, which is the second link, if I'm not terrible at copying and pasting. <laughs> um, the top link is DEA notebooks, which you can also contribute to as well. Sorry. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. It is, uh, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to see uh, open source from, uh, from government being done well. So uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, so one of the things we've done differently with Lightning Talks at PyCon AU this year is rather than having, you know, writing your name on a board that everyone can see and there's only 12 cards, we've taken a box of them and, um, well, we've actually got two boxes, uh, one for uh, people who've given talks at PyCon AU or other conferences before and new presenters and we've got a, a really good collection of, uh, of new, uh, new presenters presenting Lightning Talks and, and Bex was the, uh, the first of those uh, today. Uh, on deck, uh, we have another new presenter, uh, Daniel uh, Dararis. So if you can come in and, uh, and get set up. While, uh, is this one of your open source projects that you want people to, commit, uh, uh, to contribute to, Tim? <laughs> uh, where's Daniel Dararis? Hi. Um, for those who don't know me, <laughs> My slides should work. Where are you, Tim? There we go. <laughs> um, I'm Tim, and I have a secret. Um, some people might know me as a bit of a robot, but I'm not actually a robot. I'm a human. I'm all human inside, and like all humans, I suck. I am a constant bug generator. <laughs> I write code like this, and it ends up with all the bugs in it. The thing I like about software, though, is you can patch it. You can fix the bugs after you've written them. And I write lots of bugs, so I end up fixing lots of bugs. This is hardware. I don't like hardware very much, because it's quite hard to patch after you've put bugs in them. Then I discovered this thing called an FPGA. And FPGA makes hardware into software. And so <laughs> it was love because I can fix all my problems after I've already shipped my hardware. But there was a bit of a trouble in paradise. FPGAs are programmed in two primary languages. And you might notice neither of these are Python. Uh, Tim, do you mind if I interrupt just quickly? Uh, we don't seem to have our next presenter. Can Mary McLeod come and set up, please? Thank you. And so this makes me sad. And then I discovered this thing called MeGen, MeSoc, and LightX, and discovered that I could program an FPGA using this stuff. You might notice it's Python-based. 
So that was awesome. <laughs> and the reason this is awesome is because Python's a powerful and productive language, and it allows me to generate exactly the hardware that I need in my FPGA design. The thing is, though, writing hardware is still hard, and so I try and do as little of it as I can. The other great thing about this MeGen and MeSoc approach is they embed a CPU into your FPGA, and so you can write less hardware because most of the stuff you write is software. And as we know, I can write lots of bugs in software and then fix them at a later date, or hopefully get you to fix them for me. Um, and so you write software on a soft CPU because writing hardware is hard, and so let's do less of it. Um, soft CPU, the problem is that you currently don't use Python for this, and that makes me sad as well. Um, this is to remind me to breathe occasionally. Um, <laughs> not Python, but it turns out somebody in this conference is really awesome and designed something <laughs> called MicroPython. So we should run MicroPython on the soft CPU. And so that's what the Foopy project is. It takes a Python description of hardware and runs MicroPython on it to get you FPGAs. And so you've got Python with Python running on a bunch of hardware. And I would love help to make this work. We have a bunch of hardware here, and I will give you hardware if you come and contribute to the project. So this is pretty awesome. And you should come along and have Nirvana with me with lots of Python, lots and lots of Python. <laughs> so come and be foopy with me and get yourself some hardware. That was not your usual talk, Tim. There's 51 slides in four minutes. Con con congratulations. Um, so uh, let's try again. Is, is uh, Daniel here um, at all? OK, uh, looks like he's not going to be presenting. Uh, we had a um, uh, Katrina McDonald, if you can come and set up instead, that would be amazing. Uh, we had a. Um, a, uh, a threat to our lightning talk presenters that if they didn't show up, one of the organizers would do interpretive dance in their place. And that didn't work in the, uh, in the direction that I was hoping it seems to have been an incentive to not present. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we now have uh, Meryn McLeod, who is going to talk about the flip-flop operator in Ruby. <laughs> Oh, is this one? Yes. So, uh, five hours ago, I did not know what this was. And Tom <laughs> sent me, as the, uh, the resident Rubyist at this conference, a message asking if I knew what it was. I said no. He suggested I do a lightning talk on it. And so, true to his suggestion that teaching is one of the best ways of learning, I've spent the last uh, five hours learning what this is, and now I'm going to tell you all. <laughs> So what I'm going to do over the next five minutes is I'm going to tell you why I'm giving this talk, because Tom told me to. <laughs> I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm Marin. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you where it's from, how it's used, and the future of the flip-flopperator. <laughs> what is the flip-flopperator? No one uses this term. I'm coining it. <laughs> So basically, the flip-flopperator is two dots. Uh, it goes in between two statements, A and B, the blue and yellow things that I've put here. It returns false until A is true. Once it's been true, it returns true until B is true. And then once B has been true, it returns false. So it's um, flipping and flopping <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> So, for example, here, uh, here's some Ruby. Don't cry or anything. Uh, so we're going, those two dots are different. Those two dots at the beginning are different dots. <laughs> That's a range. 
So <laughs> in an array between one and five, we're selecting uh, uh, just between two and four with the flip-flop operator. Um, it, it was a little bit difficult for me to think of something that um, was relevant to, uh, or useful in any way. Um, <laughs> and I couldn't really find any examples online. So uh, I just wanted to put this cat, this is Monsieur Bobo. Uh, <laughs> he's a really good cat, but uh, sometimes uh, people write you know, extended screeds about how great he is and use different nicknames for him, like Monsieur Very Good Cat Bobo or Monsieur Le Petit Char Bobo or whatever. Uh, and so I've written a Bobo nickname finder using the flip flop operator. Uh, so it, um, it, it starts with the word monsieur and it you know, flips on when the word monsieur is reached and it flips off when the word bobo is reached <laughs> and it, um, it puts it in uh, from there. So you can see that in the bobo nickname finder with this a sentence reading, I've had a great day with this large boy, monsieur bobo. You may also know him as monsieur chonky bobo or monsieur loves to eat the food bobo. Uh, we have I uh, got Monsieur Bobo, Monsieur Chonky Bobo, and Monsieur loves to eat the food Bobo. So that's uh, my uh, very relevant and useful use of this. <laughs> so that's what it is. Uh, so the next next part, where is it from? It's from Perl. This is the Perl documentation. <laughs> There wasn't, there's not actually any Ruby documentation for this. Uh, there's a, <laughs> some people think that maybe it wasn't intentionally included in Ruby at all. <laughs> uh, so, so Perl got it from SED and ORC. This is the SED and ORC documentation. Uh, it's, it's a comma thing. It seems like a normal thing that people actually use in there and it's not called a flip flop operator, although it should be maybe. Uh, and they got it from um, electronics. Does anyone here understand this diagram? Good on you. <laughs> <laughs> you can now call this a flip flop operator in electronics as well. So that's where it's from. How is it used? Uh, so that someone did a, uh, a survey of Ruby. It's not used. <laughs> Nobody likes it, it's, it's rude. Uh, what's its future? Um, <laughs> it's, that's all, it's, yeah. Do you feel enlightened? <laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay, uh, so uh, if Adam uh, Jacquier Pa comes and sets up over here, that would be great. But first, we have uh, Katrina McDonald, who's going to tell us about uh, Digitech and Python in the classroom. Oh. Hi. <laughs> um, so. I got inspired to give this talk following the student showcase yesterday in the education seminar and how wonderful it was to see a lot of people coming in to watch the amazing work that the students presented. If you missed it, you should definitely follow up on that. Um, and then secondly, because of the discussion that happened during the keynote about stereotypes of what people are able to do based on what country they were born in with their technology. Um, so I teach digital technology down in Victoria. I do that because I was a math teacher whose husband comes along to PyCon and therefore I am clearly qualified to be instructing children in how to use PyCon and programming as long as I stay a step ahead of them in Grok. Um, <laughs> we're good. And really what I wanted to present today was my experiences in a slightly below um, average social economic status school where to get silence in the classroom, this happens for me when a pigeon flies into the room and there's a raucous amount of noise and then the class is silent because they've all run. <laughs> and it happens when you turn around to write, we will learn on the board and then there's a raucous amount of noise and silence because there's been a punch up and they really want to know how you react to a punch up in the middle of math class. Um, 
So yeah, I don't get a lot of silence in my room. Um, there is a lot of learning hopefully happening in that noise, but I wanted to let you know about some of the assumptions that you shouldn't make about students who are learning coding now and who form potentially your users um, because they are all there on their laptops and phones. But that doesn't mean that you should assume that they know that hands go perpendicular to a keyboard, not parallel with the monitor or at a weird like 90 degree, not 90 degree <laughs> reflex angle sort of thing as they type. And don't make the assumption that they understand what level of programming skill they have or that you have. I often have year nines come up to me who are like, miss, you need to help me with this problem. This function's not working and that dictionary doesn't happen. I don't understand why this happens and rah, rah, rah. And I'm like, cool, <laughs> cool. You know dictionaries, you're doing really well. <laughs> um, this is good. And it doesn't matter how many times I explain to these kids, I am maybe a good math teacher, not very capable in the IT area, um, they can't see that it's not always a transferable skill. Uh, and then at the same end of the spectrum, you have the kids who think that I'm an absolute IT ninja because when they have a tab open, struggling to drive here, um, if I say close the tab because I can see the game on the laptop and they go click, I understand that that's not closed and the kids think that I'm a ninja with that. Uh, they all think in some of my classes that clearly because I can run a search from here um, in the address bar, therefore whenever I give them a URL it just immediately goes here and that is how you get to a web page. There is no need to use this section of your computer or your monitor. There have been cases where despite finishing the Grok course, so clearly they'd, the ACA uh, Pi chatbot thing where they learned to do four statements. Um, we gave them a micro bit and they came and presented to me 200 lines of if statement then do this, if then do that to make a little memory game. So don't assume that they actually learnt that four statement and then definitely don't assume that they checked the, f the sorry, they checked the if statement before they copied it 200 times. <laughs> and when you politely break it to them that hey we need to fix the indentation error there 200 times, but maybe we could go look at this crazy idea of using a loop. Um, don't assume that they take that on as that we should go learn to do loops, not I'm going to fix that indentation error 200 times. <laughs> um, and then the final thing that I've learnt programming in or work, working with kids programming is that just because there's a raucous amount of noise in your classroom followed by silence, just occasionally it's because there's been some progress made. And that was our achievement last week. Thank you. <laughs>
you will register your models through the serializers with a pusher backend class and you add a, a mix into your views. Um, you define a get pusher channels method which returns a list of strings and then you can just kind of create, update and delete your models through the view and see it update. So when you're actually implementing the pusher backend, um, you'll define a simple model, a serializer, it can be as complicated as you want, and you tie these, these together with the pusher backend. So you just define the serializer class and it's just about ready to go. Um, in the background, it's using some metaclassing to register all these serializers and models. Um, so you don't need to kind of configure too much uh, elsewhere. And on the views, you'll add the model pusher view mix in and define your get pusher channels method. Um, and hopefully that should be it. Um, so it's still a fairly young project, but it does include supporting uh, public and private pusher channels. Um, you can extend the pusher backend class if you have any specific needs. Um, it, you can ignore the current connection um, if you need that. And the way it works, at least in my company, is that it's sent through a background worker, so um, that's supported. And I think this could support a lot of other use cases as well, um, but the main thing was that it can be integrated quickly. Um, I know someone who's in, uh, implemented this in with about an hour, um, which I think is pretty good. So there's a few limitations. Um, one is that with Pushy, you have a default 10 kilobyte message size limit. Um, but real-time updates should be quite small. Uh, and of course, it only works with Pusher, um, which is a bit of a problem the way I see it. So I think how this could be a bit more useful to developers is potentially generalizing this design pattern away from just, push, uh, just Pusher to other services like Ably, um, maybe Django Channels, if that's possible, since it uses WebSockets. Um, and any other recommendations about uh, how we could kind of extend it would be good. Um, and other uses for model pusher, so if there is a message size limit, perhaps we could um, send out kind of cache and validation requests through pusher and you can uh, request those objects instead. Um, that's it. A uh, special thank you to Matthew Egan for contributing, uh, Crowdcoms and Galibu, which is where I work, and PyCon for having me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that was great. I got my, uh, my one lightning talk with meta classes. I was betting on, on getting at least one, so that's great. Uh, on this side, we have uh, Felicity Robson. Are you here? Yes. Great. So you're up next. Uh, but first, we have uh, Claire Krauss, who's going to tell us about watching water from space. Hey. Space. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name's Claire Krauss and I work at Geoscience Australia. Um, Bex and I at lunchtime decided it would be fun to do lightning talks even though we had absolutely no idea what they are because we're both at our first PyCon. So, <laughs> um, I'm a scientist, I'm not a software developer. So I have a background in climatology. I did a PhD in paleoclimatology, which is reconstructions of past climate. Um, and in all of that, I did some climate modeling and discovered that software and coding is really what I enjoyed, not lab work. I hate, hated sitting there taking tiny little measurements of powder that if you sneezed, it was all over. Um, so I moved into coding because I really enjoyed it. Um, and now I'm at Geoscience Australia. I'm an earth scientist and I'm working with satellite imagery. Um, I work in the same program as Bex in Digital Earth Australia. And my job is to look at agriculture from space. So we had a problem, um, one of our government stakeholders came to us and said, we really want some help. Um, we want to know in Australia when farm storage dams are being filled and emptied. So this is a really contentious issue because um, of water use, particularly in areas of Australia where there isn't maybe as much water as people want there to be. Um, and so we wanted to keep, they wanted to keep track of when dams are being emptied and filled so that they can make sure that everybody's doing the right thing. So this is what we started with. And if you look in this picture, maybe you can spot some dams if you really sort of squint. But the data set that they had been using previously was something that had been digitized. So someone had sat there for all of Australia or all of their part of Australia that they're interested in and clicked and made a, a thing of dams. And the great thing about that is that at least they know that, you know, as, as far as that person is trained, that it's a really good set, data set. But it means that all the small dams they didn't quite get and then six months later, even you know, two months later, if someone builds a new dam, it's out of date. So we wanted to automate this. So maybe by now you've kind of found some dams in that photo. 
this is what it actually is. So if you can see those tiny little blue things that came up, so if I can, can you see just a couple of really small blue ones come up? So they're the dams that we were able to spot from space. So we have an algorithm that detects water, and what we did was we used the water detecting algorithm to find where all these dams are. Um, and as I said, I'm not a software developer, so every time I, something really good happens, I sort of stand up at my desk and go, <laughs> until everybody gathers around me and then I can tell them what I've done. So at this point I went, look, I've done it, I've found dams. Um, <laughs> but at this point it was a raster data set, which means it was uh, pixels and we didn't want that because the people that we deal with uses, use ArcGIS, which means they wanted shape files. So then I did a lot of code munging to get some, um, some uh, a polygon data set. And the, this is what that looks for. So this is the Murray-Darling Basin, and this is a polygon data set of every uh, water body in 2013. And this is an automatic process done with satellite imagery, which means that anytime there's a new satellite imagery, which in Australia is every 16 days, although we're moving to five days because we've got some new satellites that the Europeans put up, we can rerun this algorithm. So now we have a really good handle on where the water bodies are in Australia. What we can then do is look at how they're behaving. So this is one of the dams that we were able to automatically detect. And what you might be able to see is no water at the start, and then it starts doing this. And that gives us a really ind good indication that that's when the dam was built. So if you zoom in, what you can see is this particular dam is, is full, the, the person is draining it, and then they're filling it again. And so what we're going to be doing is building a flagging system so that any time it goes up, we can say, hey, were they allowed to do that at that time? And someone can take a better look. So what you can see when you do that through all of time, because we have data back to 1987, is you can see when the dams were built. You can see tailings dams. So this is the particular years that these dams were built in relation to a mine. And this was a polygon that wasn't quite right. But even though it wasn't quite right, it still gives us really useful information. So this tells us any time this particular part of the floodplain was inundated. So we still get some really useful information. Um, so my job now is, um, is to improve this and make it better and then pass it on to our stakeholders who deal with the sort of implications of all of this. Um, but yes, uh, my job is to munch code until I get cool results and then dance. Thank you. Dance. Go on. Thank you. Yep, good. Um, oh, his handwriting has improved so much since last year. Uh, Nick Moore, you're up on this side. Um, but first, uh, Felicity Robson, who's going to tell us about uh, cracking captures. <laughs> So hi everyone, I'm Felicity Robson. I'm a student, a year 12 student at Gungarland College and this is my first PyCon. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> so I want you all to think about how much information you take in on a daily basis. The sounds you hear, the sights you see, the way you interpret all this and all your emotions. That's a lot of information for you to, um, be, to be able to draw on. And you've been doing that ever since birth. Now think about the life of a program. It only has the information that you give to it and it can only can learn if you teach it. So take this picture for example, which you saw before. <laughs> now, what is this a picture of? Cat, thank you, yeah. How do you know that? You know that because well, somebody has said to you previously, that thing there with full legs and triangle ears, that's a cat. So you know that. So this is my cat, Phoenix. And what if I show you this picture? This is Phoenix too. You knew that because I just told you. <laughs> I told you that the previous image was Phoenix and you were able to apply that information to a whole different situation. I mean, it's not entirely different in this one, but... <laughs> If, if we didn't give a computer information and we told it to find Phoenix in this image, it'd be like, I have no idea what a Phoenix is. What are you talking about? 
So suddenly you go back to this image and you're like, okay, that there is Phoenix, right in the middle. And it can identify some key points from that. So like he's black and white, has triangle ears and four legs. So then you show him this picture and then it's like, oh, that right there, that's Phoenix. Thus identifying the key points uh, of Phoenix and applying it to a whole different situation. So what me and my friend Trisha, who refused to get up here with me, had been... <laughs> So what we've been working on is, <laughs> is trying to create an implementation of the SIFT algorithm, which is used to break through a recapture on a website. Do you know how hard it is to create a robot to be a program that is made to keep out robots? It is ridiculously hard. Okay, so that's sort of what encouraged us to start this program. You know, we were like, you know what? You're telling us that we need to be human to get into this website. This is robot discrimination. We're gonna <laughs> fix this. So we got to work creating our capture cracker. We decided that trying to break through all the recaptures would be insanely difficult. So we found the most common ones, which was vehicles, storefronts, and street signs. So the vehicles is way too varied. Like you've got cars, motorbikes, trucks, and whatever that blue thing is up there. Like I don't even know what that is. <laughs> And then the storefronts I thought, thought might be promising, but I can't actually tell which one of those is a storefront. So <laughs> how am I supposed to teach a computer what a storefront is, it is if I don't even know? So we agreed that street signs would be the best one because we, consider, we thought that they would be pretty universal, right? Like similar sh uh, shapes, similar sizes uh, and colors. Well. <laughs> yeah, that didn't turn out too well. Um, we found this out way too late, so we're sort of stuck doing this now. So this is what we wanted it to do. Uh, we wanted it to find the recapture, uh, the street sign within the recapture, then find the uh, recapture within the screenshot, and then therefore find the street sign within the screenshot so I can choose which points it is. So, uh, of course, no program goes without hours and hours of debugging, right? <laughs> so, the biggest problem that we came across was ReCapture would very helpfully decide that we acted too robotic and would kick us out for hours at a time. <laughs> so, we figured out that uh, if we filled it in ourselves, it, would make a, um, it wouldn't lock us out most of the time. This picture was taken earlier today. Now, another one problem that we had, so if we go back to this one, this is what we wanted to do, right? And this is what it actually does at the moment. <laughs> so that's what we're currently trying to do to fix it up. Now, if you want to see our, what we've been working on, um, uh, we've made an online journal of everything that we've done. So go have a look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, Ben O'Rice is on deck. Um, Nick Moore is going to be talking to us about brain science. Sorry, rocket surgery. surgery. <laughs> Hi, has it come up? Oh, cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Moore. This is not my first PyCon. Um, uh, <laughs> this, this is the story of a little project we did for a conference called BuzzConf. Um, uh, Andrew Fisher, Andy Gelmi and myself were talking about what fun things we could do with an outdoors uh, tech conference. Um, and thanks to Ben and Rick who were running BuzzConf, um, they gave us permission to do something a little bit silly. We were talking and we said, why don't we do some rocketry? Rocketry's fun. Everyone likes rocketry. Things exploding. That's going to, <laughs> bound to go down well. It's got lots of interesting physics, you know, momentum and, and acceleration and things like that. There's lots to talk about. There's lots of interesting things for people to learn and stuff like that. Rocketry, however, is normally a fairly expensive affair. Um, it's very large. It's very hot. It tends to explode. Uh, things like that. We were pretty sure we couldn't get away with doing that in a paddock in Balan. Um, <laughs> thankfully, it's gotten a lot cheaper to do this sort of stuff recently. Um, a really interesting technical thing happened that was just this new science fictional concept when I started uni uh, called MEMS, which is this idea of 3D 
lithography for chips where you actually carve 3D structures into a chip and use them to make a tiny little mechanical device within a silicon wafer. Accelerometers, gyrometers, barometers, things like that. That's actually a photo, a micro photograph of one, about 2.7 millimetres across that die. And you can see there's little tiny physical moving parts inside that die, which is just amazing. Those chips are now, of course, used in every mobile phone and every controller and everything like that. They're amazingly common. Um, and they're in suddenly incredibly cheap. The other thing that was incredibly cheap was uh, the ESP32 uh, processor that we used from Espressif, one of our sponsors this weekend, um, which is a 32-bit CPU with Wi-Fi on board, amazing little chip, um, and you can get them for about five bucks. So now we had a, a, a rocket telemetry system that we could put together for 20 bucks total cost. So we could make several of them, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> because they were strapped to lithium batteries and fired off the end of a high pressure jet of water and there's two things lithium batteries don't like one is impact one is water <laughs> um, so, so we expected to lose a few units um, uh, that's just the ESP32 features this was originally a 10 minute presentation but I'm just talking twice as fast so this is a prototype, um, it's an uh, uh, ESP32 development board taped to a battery stuck inside a tennis ball which I then threw across an oval with one of those dog things. Yeah. <laughs> and it turns out that just tumbles uselessly so I taped some cardboard fins to it. I, I got NASA JPL to help me out with them, obviously. <laughs> um, that's the next prototype which looks a bit like a hamburger if you're hungry. Um, that's the much better prototype that we put in the 10 rockets we put together for BuzzConf, um, wrapped in bubble wrap and so on. Uh, and that's that little purple board is the accelerometer and gyrometer and so on and so forth, soldered onto the CPU board. That CPU is capable of running MicroPython, so we got to buy a bunch of software in Python to actually do the, the telemetry. That then sent back signals, um, that's the I2C bus, reading the accelerometer, we're doing this in fast forward, talking to MQTT, and then a bunch of stuff took that MQTT and gave us live telemetry from the rockets. Um, that didn't work very well. Um, <laughs> that's a graph, obviously, it's very clear what that's a graph of, I'm not <laughs> totally sure. A uh, lot of numbers, but that's, that's uh, um, that woohoo feeling of something actually worked. I blinked an LED. In this case, I received a packet. It's a, an amazing thing. It's what keeps me doing software. Um, <laughs> it's nice when it actually works. That's a thing that worked a bit better. Uh, that's a thing that explains that a bit more. Right, rockets. So this is actually us firing rockets off at, at BuzzConf. You can see rocket ascending. You can see Andy getting soaking wet. Um, we discovered that the rocket launcher that we designed back in dry Melbourne was not very good on completely saturated ground and it kept falling over and pointing at attendees so we decided <laughs> Andy was sacrificed uh, for the greater good. Um, he was expendable so there he is. There he is again showing his use of safety gear, that's the cup of coffee. Um, and you can see some really interesting things from this. This, I, by the way, took like 400 photos to get this photo. Um, you can see the little ring of, of water flying out. You can see the thing. It's amazing that. I've got some close-ups of the actual plume of exhaust. You can see there's the, the stream of water coming out and the actual sort of steam coming off it. Uh, we actually got a successful graph. Thank you very much. <laughs> Somewhere out there, somewhere out there, Elon Musk has been watching this, deciding to go into the tennis ball manufacturer industry. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Uh, on this side, we have uh, Peter Lovett. But first, <laughs> so uh, this too is not my first PyCon. It's also not the first time I've presented this, but I have updated it. So picture, if you will. A bunch of internet libertarians walk into a venture capitalist's office and I don't have my presenter notes. Where are my presenter notes? There they are. Right. So, and the, the venture capitalist says, what's your pitch? So, miners collect transactions into blocks. They get to choose what transactions they take, so we let them charge fees. The miners uh, then 
Um, oh, Jesus, I'm not doing very well. The miners then throw as much brute force computing power as they can to take the prize in this block's cryptographic lottery. The miner goes looking for a nonce. They take their block of transactions along with the hash of the last known block and they add a random nonce and they calculate the hash of the resulting block. They do this over and over and over again. If the numerical value of that hash is lower than some threshold, then they win. They've mined a block. They get all the fees for that transaction along with the bunch of shiny new coins for themselves. If they fail, they just try again. Um, it's really hard to pick what data is going to have a particular hash, so guessing the right value for the nonce takes a ton of calculations. Something like nearly 50 quintillion hashes per second. A new block is mined on average about every nine or so minutes, which means that each block requires something like 28 sextillion, sextillion hashes to be calculated. And we just make this number bigger by adjusting the threshold every couple of weeks, so it sticks around the one block every 10 minute mark, even as computers get faster. We throw all these calculations away though because the actual point is just to show that you're willing to waste electricity faster than anyone else. <laughs> um, but now we have a decentralised currency. Nobody controls it. We can say goodbye to all that worthless fiat currency. No more will a, will a central authority tell us what to do. We can be free of all those incredible government things like taxes and fraud regulations. <laughs> and cryptography means it's secure, right? <laughs> it's not just about currency though. We can use this for all kinds of things. Just think, we could put contracts on the blockchain. We could put it on there too. Instead of currency, we can stick contracts on there and contracts that are written in code because code's always correct. <laughs> and it gets around all of those really complicated and tricky human problems that we can easily solve with maths. Uh, yeah. And because maths is provable and everything's immutable, there's no way in hell everyone's just going to scam the hell out of you. <laughs> so the VC looks at them and says, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. What do you call this crap? And the VCs reply, is everybody ready? <laughs> the, blockchain. the blockchain. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you're, you're, you're very welcome, Benno. Um, so, uh, Philip James is up on this side. Um, so, if I just block out half of this card, I'm going to read off the title that I can see here from Peter Lovett. It just says, uh, no, <laughs> I had to accept it. No, with me, everybody. No, thank you. Which should actually be no. Uh, I'm Peter Lovett. For those that don't know me, this is my first lightning talk. Oh, sorry, this is my first lightning talk today. <laughs> um, I've been to all of the PyCons. Um, I teach this. I, I teach Python in my in my job for plus plus. Uh, .com.au and um, I teach beginners, medium, advanced, but I've only just learnt about the question mark. A recap, Pythonic means uh, using Pyth Python idioms well with, uh, et um, sorry, with emphasis on readability. That's important. <laughs> emphasis on readability. What's important in Python? Thank you, yes. What do we love about Python? <laughs> it's readable, it's understandable, it's logical, it's sensible, it's obvious. In the Zen of Python, Tim Peters says, readability counts. He also says there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. Paul Dubois wrote, uh, Python is the most powerful language that you can still read. <laughs> Bruce Eckel wrote, Python is executable, Pseudocode. <laughs> Bram Cohen, uh, author of BitTorrent, wrote, uh, my favourite language for maintainability is Python. It has simple, clean syntax. Guido said um, about um, 
uh, Python being an experiment in how much freedom programmers need. Too much freedom and nobody can read another's code. <laughs> In Python, a beginner can read anybody's Python code, which is a wonderful thing for people that are learning. Just because another language has a feature or a characteristic, um, I'm talking to you, flip flopper, <laughs> <laughs> is not a reason for Python to adopt it. Um, I have done a lot of work in Perl, and Perl has lots of things that Python doesn't have. It has until loops. <laughs> and unless tests, and labelled breaks, and a bazillion operators. And that may be um, something that's had an effect on its um, use. There's a new PEP, PEP 505. I want to talk about PEP 505. Here are some examples from the PEP. In that PEP, there's a bit of code there that somebody didn't like. I don't know about you, I like that code. <laughs> I understand that code, I get that code. That code makes sense. I don't have a problem with that code. Are you with me on that code? It looks pretty clear. But they wanted to reduce the number of lines. From two down to, well, now it needs a comment, so it's now down to two. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another bit of code that was like that. And look, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the if else. Um, but after updating, it becomes question marks thoroughly. Why not an or? Now, admittedly, that's four lines of code, but I'm paid per line, so... <laughs> <laughs> I like that code. This is some more examples from that pep. I don't know about you, but I'm having trouble, man. <laughs> and the second example from the pep says, don't try this at home. And now I'm not actually sure whether they're talking about the question mark, question mark, <laughs> or the RM tree. I think it's the question mark, question mark. You can now write this. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> What the? <laughs> oh, which actually, oh, sorry, I got that wrong. That was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Reddit doesn't like it. Um, the tricky bit is that Python does need to grow and increase and become bigger and to serve ever more diverse groups and learners and peoples and tasks, but we don't want to lose what we've got. So this PEP hasn't been accepted yet. It's in draft and... Um, <laughs> What I uh, would say for those who are on my warnings talk today, warnings, do not use. <laughs> Core devs, please rethink this. Remember what we've got so that we don't lose that wonderful readability in Python. Um, or alternatively, maybe we should just add the flip flopper radar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to, uh, to coming back to this in two or three years' time when maybe one of the three operators gets accepted in a slightly different form. Uh, so uh, we're down to our last lightning talk, uh, which is uh, Philip James, who's going to talk about giving thanks. Hi, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, since I have you all, I'm going to hold a chocolate birds of the feather tomorrow, chocolate boff, bring chocolate, share chocolate. We'll get that out of the way. Hi there, my name is Philip James, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure the right way to start this cho talk. Chocolate was a good start. Because this talk is about gratitude, and gratitude is often a tricky thing to talk about in public. Sincere gratitude can make people uncomfortable because the receiver often didn't do their work for praise, but for the joy of the work itself. To make this easier, I'd like to start by expressing my sincere gratitude to someone who isn't here, Guido Van Rossum. Without his invention of Python and his decision to share it with the world, I might not have the career I have, and I wouldn't have met some of my closest fr friends, many of whom are in this room. Thank you, Guido. But Python is not just Guido and has not been for many years. Python is the community, the core maintainers, the package maintainers, the event organizers, and all the people in this room and all the other people that work in Python. And I want to make it easier to thank all of them as well. In February, a Node developer named Ferros released Thanks, an NPM package for listing all the packages a project depends on and where those packages can be funded as a way of giving thanks. He released his work right before Pi Tennessee, and while I was attending that conference, I was inspired by the question, could we do something similar for Python? So over the course of Pi Tennessee, I built Thanks for Python, a Python package for helping you give back to the Python packages you depend on. The original version looked like this. 
It scanned your requirements.txt and using a local JSON database of all the package information I could find, printed out where you could support the packages your project depends on. At PyCon US, thanks to some truly heroic efforts by Tom Marks, it t now takes in pip files and specific package names as well as requirements.txt files. Additionally, I worked with the Python Packaging Authority to get funding URLs added to the recommended spec for Python packages. You can now add funding URLs to a package's setup.py, and that URL will show up on the project's PyPI page. The obvious next step was to get the thanks package reading from a project's setup.py rather than a local database. And this is what thanks does today. You'll notice the where to thank column is tragically blank for most projects because most projects haven't added funding URLs. This is where I need your help. For the projects you use or are involved in, please think about adding a funding URL to the setup.py so we can know where to direct people who want to support the project. We can only help projects be sustainable if we know where to sustain them. If you in this room can help be the change we need to make the Python ecosystem more sustainable, then you, like Guido, will have my thanks. Thanks, Philip. Uh, that is the end of our lightning talks for today, I'm sorry. Uh, I have two cards here, which is the short list that I've unilaterally decided you're going to vote on for the most popular lightning talk of today. And the prize for it is this wonderful piece of extruded plastic from Instaved. Ooh. Uh, the short list consists of the uh, lightning talk that was an unfortunate dare from Tom Eastman, <laughs> uh, the flip-flop operator by Mary McLeod, uh, or the uh, presentation from uh, Felicity, whose co-conspirator refused to join her on stage. <laughs> uh, can we have uh, a round of applause? And we'll judge this by applause. So uh, can we have uh, applause for Marin's flip-flop operator? Okay, thank you. Um, and applause for uh, Felicity Robson's Captured Cracker. <laughs> Here, you get the giant Python st stavy staff thing. Congratulations and thank you. Right. Uh, before I hand over to uh, the Katies, um, there are more Lightning Talks tomorrow at roughly this time. Uh, registrations for Lightning Talks will open up uh, after the, the keynote in the morning. Uh, if you want to present one, uh, feel free to, to, to write, an, uh, write a title and, and write your name on it. Uh, the more detail you give me, the more I will know what you're going to be talking about and the more I can decide whether or not it's going to be good or not. So uh, lots of detail in your submissions uh, if you can. Uh, so can we please uh, have a round of applause for our Lightning Talk presenters for today? <laughs> Both of you. And uh, here's Katie. <laughs> oh, thank you. No more claps? Okay. How about four? <laughs> We have two lecterns. We also have two Katie's. <laughs> Let's give it up for Katie Bell. <laughs> I am backup Katie. <laughs> we should have a conference about Katie's. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Yeah, wonder what we call it. Anyway, um, as, as Chris said, more lightning talks tomorrow. We do have a second staff. So you could earn yourself a staff. Ooh. Um, so we have a self-organized dinner because there's 650 of you and you all won't fit into a pub. So, <laughs> KB. Yes, uh, this is the first year that we're trying this. So I apologize if it's got, you know, if we have a few kinks to work out, I would appreciate your feedback. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. We're essentially trying to solve this problem. And this is not a problem. Going up to people and saying, hey, are you folks going to dinner? Can I join you? Is not a problem. The problem is that this is a really hard thing to do, 
right? If you don't know those people, they look a little bit crazy with their arms up. Um, <laughs> going up to a group of people and saying, hey, I'm new to this conference, want to get to know a couple of people, and saying, can I join you for dinner? Because that's a really good way to get to know people. That is a really hard thing to do. And so we've set up this as a time to make that easier to do. Okay, so it's very unstructured, but basically we are designating the time directly after this session, immediately outside here, to be this is the time where it's okay to do this. Okay? Yeah. It's okay to wave your arms around. <laughs> um, but it's also okay to go up to people that you don't know and say, hey, are you folks going to dinner? Can I join you? Okay. There is a process to this. Um, there's not a lot of process and it's a very flexible process and if you want to follow not this process, that's okay. Um, the first step is to gather into a group of people that is large enough that you have people in that group who you don't know. Okay? If you have too many people that you know and everyone knows everyone else, split into two groups. If you are a small group, people will come up to you and say, hey, are you folks going to dinner? Can I join you? And then you say, why yes, our group is small, you should join us. Um, once you get to sort of eight to 10 people, it's getting a little bit hard to all find a table in a restaurant. Feel free to say, actually, we're already kind of big at this point. We already have a mixture of people. I'm sure there will be other people around. If we end up with, there's a bunch of people left around who don't have a group, we're gonna put them in a group. <laughs> and so it will work out. Again, if you're not participating in this, that's fine. Um, the next step, and this is the hardest part, choosing a restaurant. And this is because people think that choosing the restaurant means that they are, their personal reputation is tied to that restaurant. If I choose the restaurant and people don't like the restaurant, maybe the food's a little bit off, or, the, the, or not off, but like, you know. <laughs> I, oh, they mixed up my order. Clearly, um, Katie chose this restaurant. Clearly, Katie is a terrible person. Um, don't overthink it. The restaurants, there's lots of great restaurants around. There's, everything will be fine. We have, in fact, prepared a selection of restaurants which we think are big enough that they will probably be able to accommodate a large group on a Saturday night. Um, those restaurants are on cards on a pin board over at the Rego desk. If you are having trouble in your group trying to pick a restaurant, you should come over to the Rego desk and pick a restaurant. The things to be aware of, so don't worry too much about making sure that the restaurant has like 4.5 stars on some rating system. Um, do think about the price range of the restaurant. We've labeled the price ranges on the restaurants that we have. One dollar sign means you can eat for under twenty dollars. Two dollar signs means you can probably you can get a meal for under forty dollars. Three dollar signs means you know you might not have any students in your group. So, <laughs> um, but do be aware of price. Do be aware of dietary requirements. Some restaurants are better at vegetarian food than others. If someone has specific requirements, have a look at the menu online, that kind of thing. Okay, once you've gotten through the hard part, it is a Saturday night, be flexible. If the restaurant is booked out, most of the restaurants that we've picked are in areas that have lots of restaurants, just go to the one next door or find another one. Um, we have the internet, this is okay. Um, if you are having trouble, um, I will be on Slack. We can coordinate in the socializing channel and people can say, hey, our restaurant has lots of extra space. Maybe we could fit another group here. Okay. Um, we are also going relatively early for dinner. And early, for, early dinner means we have a much better chance of being able to get restaurants, uh, right, get able to get tables in busy restaurants. Okay. The last step is go eat dinner together. Um, this is the easy part. This is the fun part. Um, enjoy each other's company. If you find that you have dinner, this was great. I want to keep socializing, but now I'm with these people that I don't know and they're all going to bed because they're tired and it's been a long day. Um, the socializing channel on Slack is still there. Last night, people were great. They were posting, hey, a bunch of us are going to this pub. A bunch of us are going here. Um, keep doing that. That's really awesome. You should always be able to find other PyCon people until you reach the limit of your socializing capacity, and then you should probably go home and sleep. Okay, are there any questions? Should we do open questions? Or do we, actually, we might just do questions over at the Rego desk, and I'm gonna go stand at the Rego desk and help people find restaurants. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep talking while KDB runs all the way up the aisle, hands over a mic and runs all the way up the aisle. <laughs> So, before
before we go out and DDoS Darling Harbour, um, <laughs> we do start at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. There is going to be a delightful presenter speaking who I got all the way from Canada. So if you happen to be out very late, just remember that we would like to see you in the morning. But you do you. Um, have a delightful evening. I'll see you all tomorrow.